We could only imagine the whole world worshiping together. Do you see those words up there? With God, all things are possible. How do we know that? We know that because it says it in his word. And we know that his word is true. And he says that we can come to him with anything, pray without ceasing. And so as we begin our worship time this morning, I want us to start off with a time of prayer. So would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we're so glad that we can come before you in your presence today with our friends, with our families, with our cares, with our concerns, and with our joyful praises. We particularly lift up our president, President Trump and his wife Melania, others who are in the White House who've contracted the virus. We pray for your protection for Vice President Pence and his wife, also for former Vice President Biden and his wife, and others who are in that particular area where this virus seems to be spreading. We ask God that you provide healing where there is sickness and protection for us all. And Lord, all across this country, there are people who are suffering from coronavirus. And we pray for your healing for them and for protection for all of us. For Lord, you and only you are the one in whom we place our hope. We're so thankful that we can come to you with this today because you're the great physician and you are the almighty, our defender, our shield. In Christ's name, amen. It is a joy to be in God's house. Let's stand together and let's worship together.
all God's people said, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church. We're the Chancellors. I'm Rick. This is Carla, Jacob, Rebecca, and Sarah. We've been going to First Baptist Church for 13 years, and that includes five years while we lived in Korea. The church service there comes on at midnight, and we would often log in and watch the service. We are that connected to our church family here at First Baptist. We've since returned, and now we live in Stafford, Virginia, and it is worth the drive every Sunday to still come to First Baptist. So today, whether you're online or in the facility at King Street, please join us in worship. Okay, you can turn it off. They were so excited because it took them multiple times. I think Rick said that was take number 15. I thought you'd like to see what happened at the end. Yeah, that was pretty good. Thank you, Rick, and, and your family for doing that. You know, there was a little bit of a pause there at the end, and you probably thought, oh, no, what's happened? What's happened? Uh, and there was jubilation at the end. That's kind of how I feel about the new building. You know, we have a little bit of a pause, in not, not in our activities or anything like that. We've been over here for a while. So there was this time, and now there's going to be jubilation. And the jubilation day is October 25th. So October the 25th, you need to make sure that you register for the 9 o'clock or the 11 on that Monday. And get yourself here for the morning of October 25th, our very first day. I'm excited about that. I'm excited that Brian Jones is going to bring our message today. Pastor Don's in a revival in Richmond, and you, you knew about that, right? You knew about that already, and you can check that out on tonight, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night on the uh, website over in Richmond. But uh, today, Brian's going to bring a great message, and we're glad that he's going to do that. And his scripture today is going to be read by his daughter, Brianna. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack in any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 10. Would you stand? Let's continue worship together.
Thank you so much. Please be seated. Good morning. It's good to be with you to see so many people in the house of the Lord today. And if you're joining us online, we welcome you as well. Uh, as Roger said, my name is uh, Brian, and I know a lot of you. Uh, but if I haven't met you or don't know you yet, I was just going to let you know uh, I'm a church member. Uh, I've been a church member here for quite a while, but I also had the privilege of being one of the pastors on staff for about seven years before uh, God moved me to a ministry here in the area working with churches all around uh, Northern Virginia. But this is home. This is our home church. This is where we have chosen to raise our children and to get them to know the Lord. And so today I want to talk to you, not as a pastor, but just as one church member to another church member. You know, at the last Sunday of 2019, I preached the sermon. And in that sermon, I kind of talked about 2020 and what it was going to be like and looking for God. And who would have known now what we didn't know then in terms of what would happen this particular year? I mean, it's unprecedented, right? We're living in a day and a time that none of us have lived like before, and everything has been altered. The way you go about shopping, the way you watch sports, uh, the way you gather with your friends, uh, the way you go out to eat, the way you work, if your organization uh, has been able to change and alter the way it works to accomplish its mission, if we're doing things we never thought we would do a year ago, and in the church world, it's the same. Things have changed. You're here with masks on or you're watching at home. Churches have had to alter the way they do their ministry and the way they do their worship in order to meet the goal and mission of what God has called us to. And maybe in your organizations or industries, it's been kind of like in the church world where now some people are writing some blogs and podcasts and researchers are looking at some of the trends and Wondering what is it going to look like for the post-COVID church? What's it going to take for churches to survive and or thrive? And what are things churches need to be doing right here and now? This past week, I read one particular writer, researcher. It was a little pessimistic in tone, quite frankly. It was from George Barna, and he was just relaying that probably 20% of churches are going to close as a result of COVID. He went on to say probably 80% that do survive are going to look and feel a lot differently than they ever did before. And as I said, because I work with churches around the area, that is of great concern to me and in, re in relevance. And also as I'm a church member here, it's concerning to make sure what do we need to do? You, church member, me, church member, to make sure we survive and thrive going forward. In the other blogs that I've read or articles of those who are a little bit more optimistic about the church's future, they've said, you know, there's a lot of tips and techniques you need to start doing right here and now. You need to make sure you've got a good online presence, make sure people can give online, make sure you're live streaming, make sure you're doing Zoom, you know, for your small groups. And the list of methods goes on and on, which are good things, but I think some of those articles miss a more foundational point. What's going to engage a church to survive and thrive isn't just what you do, but who are you going to be? Who are you going to be as a church? Now, don't get me wrong. Online worship is here to stay. And there are tips and techniques we can do, but answering that more foundational question is so important. So to go back, the word church, ecclesia in the Greek, means a particular body of faithful people. So let me tell you what a church is not. It's not a building, but a people. It's not a business, but a family. It's not a particular political group, but a spiritual beacon. It's not a social organization, but an equipping center. It's not a country club for saints, but a refuge and hospital for broken people. A church is not the place you come when you have it all figured out. It's the place you come to help you figure it out. Scripturally speaking, in the Bible, it says the church is the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the family of God, the holy temple. 
At its best, the church is a vibrant movement of people committed to following and living for Jesus and seeing conversion and transformation and worshiping God and taking on issues of society that would honor and glorify God. But for that to occur, we have a responsibility. Because remember the definition. It's a particular group of faithful people. That's you and that's me becoming more Christ-like. And that's really what Paul writes to the church at Corinth. Paul had went through and established that church. He spent about a year and a half there in Corinth. He set up some leaders and then he moved on his way during his second missionary journey. And Corinth, as you will know, is similar to D.C. It was a big metropolitan area. There was a trade route there. There was a lot of diversity. It was a pretty secular city. There was a lot of wealth. There was a lot of people who felt self-important. All of that was going on while God established this church in the midst of it, and it began to grow. But it also began to have some growing pain, some issues. And so Paul took the occasion to write to them and remind them who they were to be. And he starts off saying to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. So I've got a couple of questions for us today. The first is, are we holy or are we hostile? Are you holy or are you hostile? I mean, it doesn't take long, right, to peruse the internet to see that there is a lot of hostility rampant in our culture. In fact, there's so much so that even on YouTube, there's this trend of videos called Don't Be a Karen. And if you go and you watch one of these, it's typically a middle-aged woman who is just going off on a manager or a person over what seems to be the littlest of things, but she's having a meltdown and an angry outburst. And I got to tell you, as I watch them, part of me is thinking, how can a person show such hostility? How can they be so upset over the littlest of things? But then on my sinful side, honestly, I think, boy, I wonder what that would feel like just to really let somebody have it. Just go on out at them. Well, there's no doubt there is a lot of hostility within our culture. It's almost as if our culture celebrates and rewards that hostility. And we have got to be cautious because you know what a church is? It's a microcosm of the community. And so the issues and the attitudes and the thoughts that are in the community can seep into a church if we don't do our part in growing in holiness. I've seen it in my work with churches. I've seen some hostile churches. I know everything that they're against. I don't know anything that they're for. I've seen some churches that become hostile to their community or to a group of people. The very people they're supposed to be reaching is the very people they can't stand. At other times, churches become a little hostile towards change or towards reaching people in new ways or to methods, and that can be a hostility shown. But on the other end of the spectrum, I've seen some churches where there's a hostility to scripture. Now, they wouldn't say that, but in an effort to kind of not offend anybody and accept everyone and to make everyone feel good and no one feel bad, they've kind of let anything and everything go and be acceptable. And that leads to sentimentality and is ultimately a rejection of scripture and who Jesus is. I love the quote by Bob Russell, a retired pastor in Kentucky that said, truth without love is dogmatism. Love without truth is sentimentality. Speaking in love the truth is Christianity. And you know, that's what Paul is getting at here is he calls the people of Corinth to be a holy people. And in those first 10 verses, he's going to use the word Jesus 10 times. And it's as if he is saying to be holy, you know what you need to do? You need to focus on Jesus. And is that our focus today? Is that your focus? Or are you focused on all the other things that are going on in the world? Are you focused on Jesus? Because again, why would I think my church would become holy if I'm not growing in holiness? Some of us have a a little bit more time on our hands during these days. We are working from home, and I've talked to people who have between an hour to three hours, depending on their commute and how long it took them to get ready, that now they've got available. 
How are you spending that time? Sleeping in a little bit longer, that's fine, or doing some exercising, that's good, but are you spending some of that time with the Lord to grow in holiness? I mean, what's your spiritual temperature today? We know a thing or two about temperatures, don't we? You've had your temperature taken more times in the past couple of months than you have in your lifetime. And typically, after your temperature is taken, many times you're asked at least three questions, and we've probably all memorized them, because they're this, have you traveled anywhere? Are you uh, showing any signs of coronavirus? And have you been around anybody who has coronavirus? Now, what are they getting at in that third question? Well, doctors know, science knows, if you hang around someone who's sick long enough, you know what's going to happen? You're going to catch what they have. Well, so it is with holiness. Who are you hanging around? Are you hanging around people that are making you more hostile? Are you hanging around people who are imperfectly trying to be faithful to grow in that holiness? I got to tell you, if you're spending all week in Twitter wars and online going back and forth and hearing a constant message of anger and fear from the news and other sources, and then you think you can pop into a worship service here or online and hear some uplifting music and maybe a message about hope and love and forgiveness, and that's going to fill your holiness tank, you are sadly mistaken. That's as crazy as me thinking this next week I can just eat burgers and french fries and pizza all week long. Uh, But next Sunday I'll get up and eat a granola bar and some yogurt and I'll be healthy. If we want to grow in holiness, we need to be around people who are. You know, there are some things our pastors can do for us. And there's some things we can do for each other, but there are some things we can't do. I mean, you can pray for me, but you can't pray for me. I can read scripture to you, but I can't read it for you. We can hear testimony after testimony of someone who's experienced God, and God has moved in their life and saved a marriage or healed a child or whatever it might be. But if we don't get into the game, we're never going to experience that for ourselves. The second thing I believe that we have to do to grow in that holiness is to ask the right question, which is this. Are you on God's side? Now hear me, in this day and time of a lot of anger, a lot of hostility, a lot of people getting into arguments, I hear people quickly say, God agrees with me. God agrees with me on this issue. God agrees with me on this topic, on this debate. In fact, even now within some of our praise songs, Uh, which I love, and they're good songs, but a lot of them are about how God's chasing after me, God is cheering me on, God is for me, God is for me, God is for me, which is true to a point. But taken to the extreme, that can actually lead to very narcissistic theology, where it's all about me, I'm the center of the universe, and God is there to meet my wants and my desires. The important question to ask ourselves, are you sure you're on God's side? Is your life showing that you believe what God has said, your attitude, your words, and your thoughts in line with the way Jesus lived? The good news is for churches to thrive in the future, it's going to be the same thing they needed to thrive in the past, to remain holy, which starts with you and me personally. The second thing Paul says to the church at Corinth in verses 5 through 7, you'll see, is he says to them, hey, you've been deeply enriched because of Jesus. You've been improved. Your speaking's been improved. Your singing's been improved. Your mission has been improved. And he goes on to say, I gave you my testimony. And I want you to know you don't lack anything, especially in any spiritual gift. And the implication is there, I want you to know you need to get that word out. Just like I gave you my testimony, you need to go and give yours. Which leads me to the second question, are we, are you, more of a factory or a fortress? Now, we know something about fortress living, don't we? I mean, we've been doing it for like seven, eight months, right? You remember early on when this pandemic hit, we all ran out, we bought all of our supplies, we bought up all the food. I can remember clearly being in Wegmans and there was nothing on the shelves, walking down the frozen food section and there was like four dented frozen pizza boxes and I picked one up and it said cauliflower crust. 
And I looked at Tony and I said, no way. If it gets that bad, I'll go hunt for our food. I'm just not doing it. But we gathered up all our supplies, right? And we went home and we shut the door and we locked it, pulled the shades. And there we sat with kind of walls of toilet paper to protect us and Clorox wipes to, to secure us. And one thing was for sure, no one who was in was going to go out and no one who was out was going to come in. We wanted to keep everyone inside safe. And that's what a fortress is. It's set up to just protect what is inside. And there's no desire to go outside. You want to just keep what's inside safe. Well, a church that begins to have a fortress mentality begins to think and believe that everything that's important, spiritually speaking, that takes place has to take place within these four walls. It has to be here. And one of the positive things that has happened in this pandemic is that churches have realized that they need a paradigm shift. They needed to be out more into the community. They needed to be doing things in the neighborhood. So instead of being a fortress, we need to be a factory. I mean, you know what a factory is, right? They produce a good and then get it out. And the goal is to produce more goods and get them out more. I mean, imagine how crazy it would be if a company like Apple made millions of iPhones only to keep them inside the very factory that they were made in. A successful manufacturing business knows we need a good product, we need to get it made, and we need to get it out, and the goal this year is to make more and get it out than we did last year. Well, in business terms, let me tell you, we have an amazing product, Jesus Christ, the gospel, and we need to get that word out. We're not to keep it inside these four walls. That's ultimately what Paul is saying to them. Hey, your lives have been embedded. You've been improved. You've been enriched. Why would you keep that in here? It needs to go out there. And I think that is so timely for us because in a few weeks, as Roger said, we're going to be moving into a new sanctuary. And again, just church member to church member, I got to tell you, I am really excited about that. You know, and I thank God for the people who've been on the committee and for those of you who have prayed and those of us who have given. And if you have not done those things, you can still be a part and experience and and be committed and have some skin in the game. I'm excited about it. I've seen it. It is beautiful. It is wonderful. But let me tell you something. If we move over there and we sit in comfortable pews and we take in that new car, new sanctuary smell, whatever that is, and, and we enjoy the lights, and the sound is really good, and we have nice quaint worship services, and we get complacent, God help us. God help us, because we have failed. Instead, that place, that sanctuary needs to be seen as a factory, where we go in and we worship and we thank God for the work he has done in our lives this past week with an anticipation of what's going to happen next week. And we need to be equipped and encouraged and convicted and motivated to go out and to share the love of Christ in whatever ways that we're able to do. And I got to tell you, I believe that that's going to happen. I know that's the heart of our pastors. And I know it's the heart of our pastors for when we get in there, because as we've been in this pandemic, we've functioned like a factory. You and I, under the leadership of the staff and the pastors, have done some amazing things that God has really blessed. And so if you'll allow me, I just want to brag on my church a little bit. Did you know that we have collected with some other organizations over 40,000 diapers that have been distributed throughout the community. Now, I kind of wanted that statistic to be in pounds. I was, couldn't figure out, though, do I do those pounds of diapers empty or full? So he just stuck to the number. But 40,000 diapers. We have done food packing lines for people. You have given to a fund to help people that has paid for medicine and helped with utilities and paid for food. And I love the vision of the missions office. It's not just to hand a check over to somebody and say, good, see ya. It's to build a relationship so ultimately we can share Christ. I mean, did you know our seniors 
who are kind of really held to be within their homes during this time to be safe, they haven't allowed that to be a fortress for them. They've been a factory as they've written notes of encouragement to seniors and people throughout the area who are in nursing homes. And they're going to be decorating pumpkins to go out to sheriff's offices and firehouses throughout the area. You know, our youth and children, when they couldn't do their camp and vacation Bible school here, They didn't see it as a fortress and go, well, if we can't do it in there, then I guess we just don't do it. You all got creative. You all said, you know what? I'll volunteer. I'll help make it be online. You know what? We can do it in my backyard. And literally hundreds of children who had never been a part of a vacation Bible school were able to experience it. Even some of our young children know what it's like to be a factory. They set up in their own neighborhood a little lemonade food stand to raise funds to go to missions. Not only that, we all remember Matthew and Timothy and as they dealt with the coronavirus and how we became a factory of prayer, getting the word out to over 60 countries, 60,000 people, people who didn't have a relationship with Christ said, I can pray. And we got to celebrate what God did through a parade And the testimonies of that. Some of you have begun to do things in your yards and invite people over to get the word out. Well, we're doing a VBS supply pickup and we did blessing bags. So as kids started back to school, they would have some devotional books and school supplies there. And just as an aside, I got to say to parents, you know, for those of us who have said we believe that there should be prayer in school, now what's your excuse? Because it's happening in your house around your dining room table. There's no excuse for you not to have prayer before that day starts. But we've done so many things. We've done meals for the Alexandria Sheriff, meals to Inova. And I want you to know, if you haven't taken part yet, you got a chance this Saturday. This Saturday, uh, from 10 till noon, some of our youth are going to sacrifice and be here early at 10 o'clock. And if you don't have a youth, you don't realize, but early for a youth is 10 o'clock. They're going to be here and they're going to collect the supplies. And so bring these supplies so we can help a local elementary school in the Campania Center. Oh, God has been doing some amazing things. I don't know about you, but that gives me pretty excited. I mean, can't we thank the Lord for that? If has faithfulness of what he is doing as we will faithfully follow him. But what about you? Are you a fortress or are you a factory? Are you seeing life like, you know what, I'm building up walls with people around me. I just want to acquire a bunch of stuff. I want to protect what I have. I just want to keep it all in. Or are you willing to say, I'm ready to give it away? I'm ready to give my life away through serving and through whatever way God calls me to be. The third item that Paul addresses to the church in Corinth in verse 10 is related to some division that was going on within the church. There were some people in the church who started to follow Apollos because he was a great speaker. And so others were saying, we're going to follow Peter, which that was a good choice. I mean, he walked on water. And others were saying, well, we're going to follow you, Paul, because you started the church. And that's a good choice. And then others said, well, we're following Jesus, which seems like the right answer. But Paul even kind of gave those people a hard time because they were being arrogant about it. And he says to them, I appeal to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no division among you. Which begs the question, are we, or are you, am I, are we united or are we divided? Now, if you're like me, you hear this on the news all the time on the national scene. People say all the time, we're more divided now than ever before. And people are just kind of saying, passing, yeah, but we, we need to be united. And there's no plan. There's no strategy. There's, there's no outcome of that. It all kind of becomes white noise. So where we can really begin to believe, is that even possible in any organization, in our country, in a church? And Paul would say yes to the church. It is possible, and it's something that we should be about because he is saying we need to be in agreement with no division. He's not talking about groupthink, but he is saying on the foundational issues of our faith, we have got to be in agreement. Who is Jesus? God's son, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for you and for me, rose the third day, and is our way to heaven. That the Bible is true and truth and other foundational issues, we've got to be in agreement. 
Now, Paul will later tell the church that, you know, there's some differences they have related to spiritual gifts. And he says, that's okay. It's okay to have those differences. Just don't be divisive. So that's the question for us today. It's good to have differences. It's fine to have different points of view on scripture and social issues and how to attack them and how to to be about sharing God's word with others. We won't be in agreement on everything, but does a spirit of humility and unity exist? You know, I found that the way a church handles its differences says more about the church than the differences themselves. And in my work with churches around the area, I've dealt with some that are pretty deeply divided. And right now, again, as a church member from my vantage point, I believe and feel that we at First Alexandria are very united. And we should celebrate and praise God for that because it's not a written guarantee that it's always going to be that way. And with 200 years of history, it hasn't always been that way. So how do we keep that? We stay united on who Jesus is and on the important things of our faith. And you and I grow in personal holiness. Because again, a church is a group of faithful people, you and me. So I got to ask the question, are you united or are you divided? Are you one way at church and around Christian friends and a different way at work or around other people? And maybe more importantly, when you have differences with people, do you become divisive? Because maybe the way you handle your differences says more about you than the differences themselves. Finally, I want to pose the question, are we going to be a sequoia or a bonsai tree? Now, confessionally, I'll tell you, Paul doesn't address this to the book in the book of Corinthians to the church there. In fact, this is a revelation I came across a couple weeks ago watching a TV show called Cobra Kai uh, by the renowned theologian, Mr. Miyagi. Uh, In the show, it's a show that kind of fast forwards 30 years from the original Karate Kid back in the 1980s, which as a teenager during that time was a very instrumental movie to me. And part of it, Mr. Miyagi shows Daniel how to trim and care for a bonsai tree. And I remember as a teenager after seeing that, I went out and I bought not one but two bonsai trees because I wanted to kind of do that. And you know what happened in a couple of weeks? I killed them both because it's a lot of work actually to keep that tree so small and so cute. But really that's the purpose of a bonsai tree to keep it small and to keep it cute. I mean, when it grows, you begin to cut it back. You don't move it from one small pot to a bigger pot. And actually when you stand next to a bonsai tree, you feel pretty big. You feel like you're in control. You're uh, all powerful to it. But the reality is, a bonsai tree will never give you shade on a sunny day. You you can't hang a a rope swing over it and swing off it. You can't climb it. You can't cut it up for wood to heat your home. It's meant to be small and just kind of cute and there. But it really has no beneficial purpose. I've seen some churches that are kind of like a bonsai tree. They begin to grow and change a little bit and and they kind of cut it back and the people there just want to have control over it. And you know what I have found is that those are nice churches to visit. Uh, You know, there's great people there, there's godly people there, but that's not the place you want to be if you want to see a movement of God. If you want to get the goosebumps on your neck that God is real and active and alive. Now, the other end of the spectrum are sequoia trees. They'll get to be 300 feet straight up in the air, biggest trees on the planet, 30 feet around. And I've seen some of you who've traveled out to see them taking a picture beside them, and you look really, really small. Because when you stand next to a sequoia tree, you are, and you're reminded of how small you are, and you stand there in awe and amazement of how amazing that tree is. Both of those start from a similar size seed, but the outcome is radically different. I don't know about you, but as a person who goes here to First Baptist, I want to be a part of a church that is on fire for the Lord, that we don't cut it back, we don't try to control it, we allow God to move, and we stand in amazement of it. 
And as we get ready to move into that sanctuary in a couple of weeks, I'm excited about this next chapter for the church. And my prayer has been and will continue to be that we continue to be a holy factory, equipping and sending out disciples as we are united in Christ. And we can then stand back in awe and amazement of what God will do. Amen? Pray with me. God. This morning, I am so thankful for so many things and so many people who are here and who have helped in my personal spiritual growth and in my families. And God, even here today, as Sherry Graveson's here, it's a testimony to the work that you are willing to do and an amazing thing. And God, we just thank you for the work that is continuing to go on for us to be that factory. And God, I would pray today that if there was someone here who doesn't have that relationship with you, who is kind of hostile to you, that they would accept you as Lord and Savior. For others who might be here, or even at home, who want to be a part of this congregation, this group of people attempting to faithfully follow you, I would pray they would join us and take part. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be down front if you do want to come forward as Roger leads us. Stand with us, we we'll stand and sing together. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the Sabbath. Please be seated. We're so glad you joined us today for worship. I'd love to tell you about some things that we're doing at First Baptist. Uh, so I'm going to start with the first one today. A quarterly business meeting and foundation report will be held virtually on October 11th at 6 p.m. The Zoom link, dial-in information, and link to access the quarterly report will be sent out in the eBeacon on Tuesday, October the 6th. Today, Brian gave us a great challenge, and we've got a great opportunity coming up to be Jesus in our community. So we're going to have a supply drive for Campania Center and for MacArthur Elementary. So from 10 a.m. to noon on Saturday, October the 10th, 10th, please bring your diaper and school supplies to the FBCA parking lot. I want you to check out our social media and the eBeacon for specific things that you can bring to help make this a huge success. The next one comes from Karen Lynn Jenkins. She says, it's time for another picnic in the park. On October 8th at 11 a.m., we will decorate pumpkins for homebound folks. So to register, email carolyn at fbcalexandria.org. We've got a mission trip opportunity for you. It's a virtual mission trip to the Lebanese Society for Educational and Social Development, and it'll be on Saturday, October 17th from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. You can register in advance for this free webinar at fbcalexandria.org slash missions. Also, we want to thank you for your support for the Alma Hunt Virginia Missions Offering. FBCA's 2020 goal was $16,000, and you've already given more than $15,000. So thank you for that. 
Let's pray together as we go uh, out for the rest of our week. Lord, thank you for the challenge that you have given us today through your word. Would your spirit work in our hearts, produce in us a heart that pleases you. Amen.